look at cinema and live events, uh, such as 360 videos and so on, you're looking at uh, experiences that require more media compute, uh, media decoding capabilities, as well as some post-processing that's going to be needed after that. Um, and then some can be either or, uh, things like real estate. Uh, you might be, you might have 3D models of a home that's not even built yet that you want to um, you know, walk through, navigate through. Or it could be something like a camera rig that you have in a rental uh, place that uh, you want people to uh, look into and look around and experience. Uh, it's also important for us to understand the experience in terms of what are the knobs that are being uh, turned here. Uh, I've listed uh, three of the key things I think are, are important to understand. Uh, the immersiveness of this experience. Um, so this requires things like a uh, large field of view. So to support these large field of views, you would want uh, higher resolutions, a lot of optics that support that field of view. And that, what that means is that you know, now you have high resolution displays here, you have to render higher uh, resolutions in your graphics render, you have to have a high throughput going from the whole system out. So you have a lot of implications based on what knobs you're turning here. Uh, responsiveness is another uh, factor here where you want that uh, low latency for your motion to photon latency, for example. Uh, what that means is that you, know, you have these really high frequency sensors here, and this data needs to be transmitted into the system very quickly with low latency, accurate time stamping. You have to quickly understand the head pose, uh, and then determine where that person is looking at, where that person is expected to look at a few, few milliseconds out, and then based on that information, uh, render the scene. So that requires uh, very low latency going in, low latency going out, and also high uh, uh, compute at low latency as well. Um, interactiveness, we think uh, this is another area that's coming that can also push the bar in certain areas. Uh, so for uh, interactivity, uh, natural interactions with your hands and so on, you may have additional cameras on your head-mounted displays, you may have peripherals that are looking towards you, uh, and again, this also requires some data to come into the system, uh, and we have to understand that and understand what is the compute need based on that. So that might also push the bar in terms of your uh, compute processing needs for your computer vision, taking that depth information, analyzing it, and, and making sense out of it, um, and, and so forth. Uh, interactiveness can also be your voice, you know, capturing your voice, recognizing the uh, user, or understanding what the user is saying, and then uh, acting based on that to understand. <coughs> So uh, when we talk about mainstream and uh, enthusiasts or, or premium VR experiences uh, and enabling those or enhancing those, what we're really talking about is the scalability. Um, so for VR experiences for the mainstream, we're looking at a couple of aspects, uh, how the content needs to be uh, scaled, and this is more for the uh, content developers that might be in the audience here today, uh, how can you develop, develop um, experiences that are scalable, that can run at a very high end, but can also scale down to something that might have lower performance, but you can still deliver a similar kind of experiences. And the other is uh, performance optimizations, and the, these are, the lower they are, the better in terms of if you get graphics optimizations, OS optimizations, VR framework, framework optimizations, that really help uh, the overall experiences, what, whatever workload you're running, really improve and, and really scale down in terms of uh, what is that bar that you want to hit? Um, and then enhancing that VR experience. Um, so this is about what are the new capabilities that are coming in, things like hand tracking, uh, voice interactions, uh, and it can be things like also uh, uh, some of the audio processing things, uh, more complex audio processing that is dynamic, so in real time, so as, you, as things move around in your environment, uh, the sound uh, reflection changes and the reverb effects uh, uh, are taken into account and you hear that natural sound in your environment. Um, and also collision avoidance, right? Uh, uh, today, uh, um, there, there's minimal movement you can have in VR typically. Um, so if you have an understanding of your environment, if you know that your desk is there or you have some object here that you don't want to step onto, um, you know, having an understanding of where things are in your environment will help with that experience. 
Also, we are looking at uh, things like uh, improving that plug and play experience. So if you look at solutions today, you have your HDMI cable, you have your USB cable, you may also have uh, another cable for your power. Um, so going forward, we can see that kind of going from multiple cable solution to a single cable solution using something like a USB Type-C interface, and also uh, further down the line, you may see some wireless solutions as well. So uh, if I sort of <clears throat> make this into visual, what I'm going to try and talk about here today, we have these VR experiences today, um, and it's about this affordability of VR solutions and how we can scale these so we can deliver similar equivalent kind of experiences with less uh, by while still reducing the affordability or, or, or making it more affordable. Sorry. Uh, one of the things that will come. Uh, take into account is the cost over time. So as, uh, you know, as uh, components cheap get cheaper or as, as we get more performance with same, similar kinds of uh, uh, cost components, uh, we expect uh, the cost to go down in, in, this, in this sense. Also, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the scalability of content, if you can make things scalable, uh, that'll also help reduce that uh, entry into that VR. So you can, what, what used to cost 1500 plus uh, today, you can get it down to 1200 or even $1,000 solutions that uh, more people can uh, afford and, and, and buy an experience. And then uh, uh, performance optimization is another angle that we'll be looking at. Uh, and, and all these factor in, so you have a very high bar today. Um, it's like a one size fits all, right? Do you either have that VR ready spec, or you can't really experience uh, too much VR, too many VR experiences on uh, PCs. We expect that to uh, be more tiered, so you may have a very high end experience, uh, which may which may have that you know fifteen hundred dollar mark, but you may also have a VR experience that can run at maybe eight hundred or, or somewhere around there. And then over time, uh, we'll get new capabilities, and new experiences, and this is all about more about the enhancement of these VR experiences. Um, and then similarly with these experiences, you may have a, a high bar at the beginning here, but then you can kind of see that trickle down as we get more optimizations in place. So uh, let's start with VR uh, mainstream experiences. So when we talk about the uh, scalability of content in uh, these experiences, uh, a good example of uh, the scaling is uh, this adaptive quality feature that was introduced by Valve. Um, this allows for uh, runtime scaling of um, things like your re render target resolution, your MSAA configuration, and that really helps uh, you know, avoid dropping frames, right? So if your system is not able to perform well, it keeps track of how much of your GPU is being used and, and, and allows your uh, uh, quality to adapt and make sure that you, you hit the key uh, performance indicators such as uh, you know frame rates and, and latencies. Um, another part that uh, probably could use more work is uh, in this uh, performance tiers, right? Uh, if you look at uh, traditional gaming um, content, you have contents that can render at uh, high resolution or or with a lot of polygons, but uh, if you detect low low end systems, your uh, content can also run just uh, with uh, lower polygons or, and so forth. And I think some, something similar needs to happen uh, for VR experiences. Uh, if you develop only for the very high end, um, you, you are pretty much limiting your, your market there. Um, and if you can have tiered experiences, uh, delivering that same kind of experiences uh, and, and um, while you know, increasing your market, to, to, it, it can uh, help your business as well. Um, and then, uh, in terms of uh, making use of your resources that are available on your whole system, so if you look at uh, typical VR workload, uh, you might see that CPU is used around, depending on your systems, 20%, 25%. Um, so you can use more of that CPU, uh, offload some of that uh, work from the GPU, um, and one good example is this full VR rendering concept. Um, and then there, there are a couple versions of that, right? Uh, there's the um, fixed version where it's based on your optics. Um, you know, you, you have an understanding that your optics are going to uh, have some uh, distortion. So you say around your peripheral, you uh, render a low resolution there. Um, and then the, the gaze, uh, gaze manipulation or eye trackers, um, that's the next step, right? Uh, um, 
optimizing your render uh, based on uh, your gaze information. So this requires um, taking your input from your eye trackers, doing gaze estimation uh, algorithms on your uh, CPU, and then uh, adjusting your render based on that, uh, uh, the gaze on the gaze coordinates. So th this may put a little bit more work on the core side, but it alleviates a lot more, a little bit more on the GPU side, helping you target uh, maybe one one uh, uh, tier lower uh, GPU um, spec. Another way to make use of the resources on the whole system is to make use of uh, the integrated graphics. So if you have a discrete graphics, uh, your integrated graphics might be idle most of the time. Um, if you look at the VR solutions today, some of the experiences, you're looking at um, graphics rendering that happens around 90% of the time on the GPU, uh, and then you have uh, 5 or 10% of that time spent on graphics post-processing. So this includes things like your um, barrel distortion, composition, uh, time warp or representation, um, those kinds of uh, processing. Um, as you try to target lower end uh, GPUs, uh, this number, this 5 to 10% number can increase. So to offset this, uh, it's, uh, it's possible to uh, move these over to the GPU, integrate graphics, uh, have this do this uh, function, and allow most of your uh, discrete graphics to keep doing your GPU rendering. Um, so if, if, uh, just, if I just describe the diagram here, you have your GPU rendering, um, this is your basically your graphics scene rendering. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of one of the VR workflows I was running in my lab. Um, and then we see a little bit of uh, these uh, post-processing that happens right before you uh, render onto a display. So um, the, the point here is that if you try to target a lower performing graphics, this part may increase. But if you offload it onto integrated graphics, it can keep using most of your GPU for your render and then not worry too much about uh, whether you get the composition there in time or how much your composition is taking up. Um, and then this is another uh, way to make use of integrated graphics along with your discrete graphics. So there are some concepts such as these interleave time warps or reprojections. Um, I think this still needs to be a little bit proven out a little bit in terms of the user experience, uh, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, there might be some cases, uh, depending on your uh, use case, where this may or may not work. Um, but it's a good concept to really uh, you know, uh, allow the gra your graphics to take more time while your, um, your motion is, your, sorry, your perspective is up to date. So you're basically decoupling your uh, display rendering versus your graphics rendering. So your display rendering is still constantly going at 90 hertz or 120 hertz but your graphics rendering can perhaps go at half that frame rate at either 45 or 60 hertz. And all these optimizations, what they lead to is the ability to go a little bit lower in the GPU cost and making this all a little, more, a little bit more affordable. So we'll, we'll switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the enhancing of these VR experiences. So if you look at the uh, processing needs for virtual reality, um, you would have your inputs, as I mentioned, which can be your uh, positional information, or IME sensors, that can be your gyro accelerometers. And, and um, your positional, depending on your solution, could be an uh, IR camera pointing towards you. It can be your light health solution in case of uh, like CC by. Um, and this is brought into your, your um, CPU for uh, understanding where, where your head pose is, and also calculating your, uh, where your head pose will be. Then all of this, uh, once you understand the head pose or where, where you're going to be looking at, you submit the, the commands to the GPU, you do some physics simulation on your CPU side, and your GPU takes over from here and does, that, does actual graphics rendering. And then from that point on, you would, uh, this is the second part of the composition part where you do some reprojection, distortion, and then that would be output into this clip. Along with that, you would also have some audio components. So you, from your um, um, virtual environment, you understand where your virtual sources are based on that. Uh, you would do your spatial audio processing, and this can also go out into your, your uh, headsets as well. 
So then you, all, you can start having uh, some interaction, like hand tracking, so some more inputs here, uh, some cameras that might be mounted on your HMD, it might be somewhere in your environment, and, and uh, for those you would need some more processing in terms of hand joint positioning um, to understand where your hand pose is. You may also have eye tracking. Um, this is uh, some of the focus today to, that really, you know, people see this as another way to really alleviate some of that work from GPU. Uh, but it does come with cost. Uh, you do have to get the data into the system. Um, you have to do the gaze estimation. And then, and then based on that information, you have to feed the, the right uh, um, perspective into the uh, GPU. You also have things like collision avoidance, like I mentioned earlier, um, understanding what is in your environment, uh, what are the objects that uh, you need to avoid. Uh, you also have to, uh, you may also have some object scanning. So uh, scanning objects, uh, bringing them into your virtual uh, some data going from that uh, camera again into the system, uh, detecting the edges uh, and, and understanding what, recognizing what the object is and bringing those in. Uh, and it could be room scale as well, scanning the entire room uh, and, and bringing that into the environment as well. And this really goes a little bit beyond virtuality, maybe more towards the mixed reality uh, experiences. And what this boils down to is, uh, as you add more and more capabilities for your VR experiences, you'll have to expect, you'll, you'll expect more and more compute to be needed. Um, so, uh, it's important to plan for the scalability um, based on the experiences you're targeting, the, the components you're going to be having on your HMDs, a, a peripheral you might be developing for VR. Uh, you'll need to understand what is that system impact overall, um, and, and we can definitely help with that uh, in terms of uh, you know, what, what kind of interface you need, uh, what is the expected throughput, what is the overall um, um, impact into that system. And then shifting gears a little bit towards um, the connectivity here. We have, uh, uh, today, we have that HDMI cable, you have a uh, USB cable. How can you combine that? Um, it seems like one of the, the key candidates are, is this uh, USB Type-C connection. Uh, this is ideal. Uh, it can support uh, a USB traffic coming into the system. Um, it can also support higher power to deliver to that uh, head mounted the display. Um, and it also has more throughput in terms of display as well. Um, so if you're thinking about uh, increasing your display panel resolution in your head mounted display, if you're a head mounted display developer, um, this is something you might want to consider. If you're adding more components uh, for your head mounted display, um, such as cameras, they can add, you know, each, each camera can be anywhere from a, a few hundred milliwatts to a, a few couple watts. Um, you need to plan for that to understand what does that mean, uh, how is that connected into the system, if it's an add-on camera, is it going to be connected to the HMD, are you going to have a separate cable into the system, um, those are some of the design, design decisions you need to factor in. Um, if you're connecting to the head-mounted display, uh, you need to understand is that overall um, power enough uh, that's going to be delivered from the, uh, from the system. And this also impacts the design of the whole system as well. Um, not all USB Type-C ports are equal. Uh, some, may, some may deliver more power, some may deliver less power. So this really gets into what is a VR-ready system. Um, today, I think it's a good start. Uh, it, it started with uh, uh, GPU spec, uh, you know, a certain level of GPU spec, a uh, certain level of CPU, uh, and some me memory capacity. Um, those are some of the key. Uh, parts of this uh, factors for the um, VR gateway system today. So going forward, we see this kind of expanding more at a system level, which require things like what are the I/O needs for a VR system? Um, do you need to have uh, a USB Type C? Do you need to have a Thunderbolt going over that uh, Type C connection? Uh, what does that power delivery mean for a VR uh, system? Uh, so those things uh, should be considered, uh, and, and we believe that um, next generation of uh, head mount displays will uh, push these bar even further in terms of display resolutions. It may go up in frame rate as well, uh, depending on um, the particular solution. 
Uh, and as you go up in these uh, specs, uh, it's expected to consume more power. Another con uh, thing to consider is the length of this cable. If you look at uh, USB Type-C, you have several options. You can go with a passive copper, you can go with active copper, you can also go with uh, active optical. And this may depend on your, the scenario, what kind of uh, experience you're targeting in terms of where is that user, um, how is the user going to ex have, uh, experience that uh, particular um, usage. So uh, some things like wearable compute, this is up and coming. I think uh, we are seeing some uh, PC vendors uh, develop these uh, backpacks. Uh, and, these, and also there are some concepts uh, and people have concepts around uh, belt design, vest designs, and so on. Um, where you may, you may be okay with sort cables. So you may go with a, a passive copper that's maybe around two meters long. Um, and then you may go into uh, something like an Oculus uh, kind of experience today where it's a seat, primarily a seated experience. You can probably do it standard, uh, standing, but I think most of the experiences today are seated. Uh, in that case, uh, if you factor in the fact that your desktop might be sitting behind the desk and you have to route the cable out, uh, you're probably looking at somewhere around 5 meters uh, of cable. And in this case, you, you, you could be looking at active copper, uh, and then you, you'll, have, you'll also have to make decisions around uh, cost versus uh, performance there. Um, and then when, when you go into the walk around or free roaming experiences, uh, this is where it really starts to push the bar in terms of uh, the length of the cable you need, uh, and, uh, which could be 10 meters plus, um, and that um, may force you or, or you may choose to go with uh, active optical cables at that point. Um, active opti optical cables uh, you know, are ideal. You can go up to uh, around 60 meters, uh, maybe even more depending on the solution. Um, and uh, so 10 meters plus is definitely possible with, with these, these kinds of solutions. Another thing to consider is the, the overall throughput. So uh, if you look at uh, some of the VR solutions today, those, it's primarily these two uh, rows we have up here. So uh, the, the consumer version of uh, the Oculus Rift uh, is to survive. It's uh, basically the 2160 by 1200 at 90 FPS. And, and you can kind of see what that looks like in terms of throughput. Um, it, it's completely fine with HDMI today. Um, it, uh, you know, and, and uh, if you go forward, and when you try to increase these resolutions, uh, and, and these numbers here are a little bit speculative here. We'll have to see exactly what numbers uh, these vendors will land um, in, in the future. But uh, we can definitely expect these numbers to go up. Um, so if you're looking at uh, something closer to 1440p at 120 or 2080 by 1600 at 90 hertz, um, you're looking a little bit more throughput. And then you start to see uh, some areas where you can't support it with uh, a particular display port interface. So this gets into things like what does uh, what display port interface does your system support? What HDMI version uh, does your system support? And, and planning accordingly. So and, and, you know, and then if you look at USB Type C Thunderbolt, um, you can see that uh, that can not really offer much more throughput versus the others here. And this, just keep, this trend just keeps continuing as you go higher in the resolutions. Um, so uh, if you look at the 4K resolution at 120 or um, uh, 4, 4, 4, 20 by 2100, this can be a couple of years out, but then you start to see the throughput needs for the system is getting close to 30, 35, 34 gigabits per second. And you get to a point where with the, the traditional cables, you'll either need compression or you just can't do it. Uh, you just can't uh, send these through the regular uh, interfaces. So this is, uh, this is where we start, where we believe we'll start to see um, the transition from uh, something like a display port to uh, a Thunderbolt uh, solution or something similar. And then if you go even beyond that, uh, you know, we're also looking at near-term as well as long-term uh, things like uh, four or five years out. Um, and uh, at that point, you may see uh, some resolutions around that 5K. And, and then you start seeing um, 60 gigabits per second. 
And uh, with the uh, standard uh, display interfaces today, uh, you either have to compress or you really can't support these kinds of resolutions. So um, the basic takeaway here is that you know, as we increase these display specs, we have to really take into account what that means in terms of uh, what interface you're going to have between these uh, the head-mounted display and your whole system, and uh, you know, planning ahead. So basically, taking that VR ready spec uh, and making sure that we understand what is, what are the needs on, for the head-mounted display to support these experiences or to support this throughput and making sure you, you, you uh, spec accordingly. So these, these have been going the other way, right? Uh, the, the first half has been really talking about um, keeping that experience the same, flat, and then how can we scale things down? And then these are really trying, we're trying to look at, okay, how can we enhance these experiences uh, by increasing these resolutions, you know, you start to eliminate or reduce that screen door effect, and that can help the user experience as well. So uh, at this point, I'll talk a little bit about uh, going wireless. Uh, I don't know if some of you may have visited my booth. Uh, we have a demo going on um, in the showcase where we have uh, a wide gate connected to uh, connecting the head-mounted display and the whole system. And, and there are several ways it's going wireless. Uh, uh, the cable can be a hindrance. Um, you can get tangled up. Um, it can also pull, pull on your head, so you might feel less immersed as you, you know, as you constantly feel, feel that pull on your head. Um, as I said, you can get tangled up, you can trip, trip over these cables, and it can be actually dangerous. dangerous. Um, and also, given that freedom, the ability to move around freely without these cables, I think it'll allow for more creative and innovative experiences. So this is one area that we're looking at to see uh, you know, going from these multiple cables and then to these single cable solutions that we talked about, and then eventually going to wireless. So um, what we have uh, today is basically uh, we have a VR-ready system, uh, we, uh, and this is a proof of concept at this point, um, but we've uh, connected wide gate source on the whole, uh, whole system side, and then also on the head-mounted display side, we have a wide gate sync module. And the data is tra being transmitted through the 60 gigahertz channel, uh, basically your USB data, so it, uh, or what you use to transmit over USB, such as your accelerometer and Zio data, that's getting transmitted into the host system through the, the wireless link here. Um, and then your host system does all the processing in terms of um, rendering your scene, uh, also rendering your audio aspects and so forth, and the data is routed back to the head mounted display through the same wide again interface. So uh, this is a proof of concept. Uh, um, it's, it's actually um, a fully contained system on this side with battery. Uh, we also have some headphones. Um, several configurations with the headphones. You can either have it through going through wide gig or you can also connect through the, the wide gig to have the uh, audio go over that. Um, and, and we see this as a potential. And um, the reason we chose wide gig um, you know, with Wi-Fi, you may be able to get the throughput you need, but it is a shared medium, whereas uh, Wi-Fi is more deterministic in terms of uh, keeping that low latency. Uh, it was designed for high throughput, low latency, and, and you feel that that's the right combination you want for these VR experiences. Um, you don't want to have to be waiting for another device that's connected that might be taking up some of your bandwidth, and you might end up dropping frames or reducing your frame quality. Whereas with wide you have a little more deterministic one-to-one -one, uh, connection there. <coughs> All right, so I think uh, you know I'll, I'll jump into the summary here. Uh, basically, I think we have opportunities here to work with uh, many de developers. Whether you are a software developer, uh, whether you're working on application development, uh, whether you're working on the, the framework development or in driver development, um, as well as some of the hardware aspects, whether you're developing um, uh, head-mounted displays, uh, you know, we can help uh, understand what you're planning for head-mounted displays, what are the components on the device, uh, what are the data throughput needs, uh, what are, what's your uh, power consumption need, how does it connect to the PC, uh, and let, let's make sure that uh, we, we design, you, know, you design this properly, 
and we have this uh, as part of uh, this uh, VR ready spec that may be a, a tiered spec that we use. Um, app developers, uh, this is uh, you know scaling that content so uh, you know you can stay with that high end um, and your your target maybe in, in terms of millions if if you really scale these down you may be increasing that uh, market into tens of millions or hundreds of millions depending on how how, how you can really scale that content. Um, making sure that uh, you're enabling that hardware acceleration, things like media, uh, 360 videos, those should be uh, pretty straightforward for uh, PC systems where we are seeing that uh, you know some apps are not using the hardware acceleration, they're not using the media engine, so uh, we can definitely help with some of that enablement, making sure that your application is fully optimized, you're not just burning power, you're not able, you know, you're not hitting the uh, performance limit just because you're not uh, uh, implementing properly or making use of that uh, uh, available resource. Um, we also talked about uh, VR framework uh, performance optimizations uh, as well as some of the native OS support here. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, engaging with some of the OS vendors and, and I, you know, we'd really like to see this uh, VR experience being supported natively through the OS and, 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 and I think there, is, there was or there are some announcements around there um, today regarding uh, some of our engagements with the uh, OS standard. Um, and then graphics and, and system manufacturers. Um, uh, we have some expertise in terms of system thermals um, and, and some um, power uh, budget aspects uh, depending on your form factor. Uh, whether you're trying to target uh, a gaming system but you still want a, uh, a very thin device, uh, those are some of the things that we, we have some expertise in to help uh, give guidance in terms of those areas. Uh, I.O. considerations as well. Um, we have expertise around the uh, uh, Thunderbolt, around these wireless interface, um, and uh, definitely we can, I think we can work together to really um, uh, deliver the experience that you're looking for. Uh, whether uh, whatever the web you are, whether you're developing a on display or, or, or software, uh, we're, we're open to this uh, collaboration here. Um, and then uh, additional sources uh, regarding um, uh, this uh, session. Uh, we, as I mentioned, I, I do have a demo showcase running on the first floor uh, at the booth 580. Um, and uh, we will, uh, you'll be able to see how our proof of concept uh, for the wireless uh, VR solution today. Uh, it is a proof of concept. We are working on some angles to improve that, but uh, I think it's, a, it's definitely good to experience. And if you have time, please, please come by and, and see us at the, the booth.